breaking news. No charges against President Biden after that special counsel investigation into his mishandling of classified documents. But the bigger fallout may come politically with this report calling into question his memory and mental state. Fierce pushback from Team Biden tonight. We're going to take you live to our team, fanned out across all of it with more on how we got here and what comes next. The other big news tonight, major arguments in front of the Supreme Court about whether one state can kick Donald Trump off the ballot this year, why the justices seem to be leaning toward letting him run, and at least six people, including kids, presumed dead after a shooting and a fire at a home outside Philadelphia. New details on where that investigation stands when we take you live to the scene. Plus, what's behind a close call, this one at Boston's airport today. Then the reboot for Bud Light after an infamously difficult year. Why it's betting on this weekend's Super Bowl to supercharge its flailing brand later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and we are coming on the air tonight with President Biden cleared of criminal charges for mishandling classified documents. So legally, out of the woods. But politically... Maybe a different story. After this scathing report described President Biden multiple times over nearly 400 pages as, in their words, an elderly man with a failing memory, suggesting no jury would convict the president for holding on to these documents. Remember, this was in the material found in the president's Delaware home and Washington office from back during his time as vice president. Special counsel Robert Hur says while the president willfully held on to some of that stuff and then told somebody else about them, his ghostwriter, saying in 2017 he had just found all this classified stuff downstairs, he's not prosecuting. Remember, the documents were found in a badly damaged box next to a bunch of, like, random household stuff. With the House GOP leadership tonight team tonight calling the report disturbing if you will. And that leads us to the next piece of this, right, which is the potential political fallout here, because you are seeing several matters of distinction between former President Trump and President Biden with these questions tonight about, if you might be asking, well, wait a second, what is the difference between Donald Trump mishandling classified docs, he was criminally charged, and President Biden? Well, the special counsel is preempting that question, pointing out some big differences between these two cases, saying when President Biden's staff discovered the documents, they were immediately turned over to investigators right away. On the flip side, remember former President Trump's accused of refusing to return these documents, even after he was asked repeatedly to hand them over, allegedly obstructing justice by asking his staff to destroy evidence and then lie about it. So now, while President Biden's attorneys are praising the decision not to charge him, they're also slamming the special counsel for comments about his memory and mental state that they say are not only not accurate, but not appropriate. Here's the president himself in just the last 40 minutes addressing it all. Special counsel acknowledged I cooperated completely. I did not throw up any roadblocks. I sought no delays. In fact, I was so determined to give special counsel what they needed, I went forward with a five-hour in-person interview over the two days of October the 9th, 8th and 9th. And he notes October 8th and 9th, of course, right after the October 7th attack on Israel. We're going to get to more on this in a second with our team coverage. NBC's Ken Delanian joining us. Ali Rafa posted up near the White House. Legal analyst Danny Savalos is joining us, too. So, Ken, help us understand something that is central here. The special counsel in this long-anticipated report says that President Biden did, quote, willfully hold on to classified documents and then told somebody else about him, but they don't think it rises to the level of a criminal prosecution. Why not? It's a great question, Hallie, because by saying they believe he willfully retained, well, that's a crime. I mean, that, that is the language of the statute. And they're saying there's evidence that he did that. But then they go through a whole series of mitigating factors explaining why they don't think they could win a conviction and why it may not even be appropriate to bring a case. And one of the main things they cite is President Biden's failing memory. And that goes to the issue of why, what was it gratuitous that they included all that information about his memory lapses? They would say, no, we needed to explain that because that's one of the reasons we think he would be very sympathetic before a jury. They called him an elderly man with a failing memory. That's indisputable. And so uh, you can argue that they went too far and they described a lot of uh, memory failures that they didn't need to describe from their five-hour interview with Mr. Biden. But that was central to the issue of why they couldn't Prove the case. There were other issues as well. They talked about, look, they're, they're saying that President Biden had notebooks that included classified information, but other presidents did that as well, including, the report says, Ronald Reagan. He had classified information that was stored in his home for years. Nobody did anything about that or brought any charges. So there are mitigating factors that made this case difficult to prosecute. But the memory stuff, that's what's going to stick politically. And, you know, there was a significant passage where they talk about that they say that President Biden could not remember 
when he was vice president. He got the dates wrong. And he couldn't remember when his son Bo died. But what really struck me, Hallie, was because I covered this at the time, was he mischaracterized then ambassador to Afghanistan Carl Eikenberry's position on this key fight that they were having in the Obama administration about whether to send troops. That was something that President Biden cared a lot about. He focused on it. It was a passion project for him. He was arguing that they shouldn't expand the footprint in Afghanistan. He lost that argument, but he forgot. He completely mischaracterized the position of Carl Eikenberry. And the special counsel found that a notable memory lapse, not just an old man forgetting a date, but a significant, significant memory lapse, Allie. So, Ali, the, that leads us directly to the Biden team, the president's attorneys, really pushing back on this hard. On the one hand, they're like, yes, it was the right decision not to criminally charge. But on the other, they are blasting these references that Ken has noted to the president's faulty memory, to his mental state, et cetera. Some of the pushback is contained in this report. Some of it comes outside this report. Walk us through it. Yeah, Hallie, and I thought it was particularly notable that in those remarks that the president made in Leesburg, Virginia, just in the last hour, he did not mention any of these mentions in hers report about uh, his age or his lapses in memory. But we are hearing from uh, some of the president's personal attorneys reacting to this nearly 400-page report. One of them, uh, special counsel to the president, Richard Sauber, saying that the president's inability to recall dates or details of events that happened years ago is neither, neither surprising nor unusual, especially given that many questions asked him to recall the particulars of staff work to pack, ship, and store materials and furniture in the course of moves between residences. He continues, yet unlike your treatment of President Biden, your report accepts other witnesses' memory loss as completely understandable given the passage of time. And in another statement, he objected to what he called quote, inaccurate and inappropriate comments, Hallie. And remember, we knew that advisors privately had been concerned that this uh, report could publicly paint the president as perhaps being sloppy or careless in his handling of these classified documents. But it, it, these mentions of these memory lapses uh, because of his age are seemingly more, even more of a trouble for the president and specifically his reelection uh, campaign. So it's what's going to be extremely interesting to see now is how the Biden campaign, if at all, tries to spin this in their favor. Could we potentially see more of the president uh, talking about this, addressing it? Because remember, this is a White House that essentially likes to err on the quote, less is more uh, approach when it comes to the president and having these impromptu Allie, conversations yeah. with vote. Yes, Hallie. Well, part of why, because I want to get at a point that you're making here, because part yeah. of why, and I've been chatting with sources about this in the course of the last couple of hours here, and one point that's come up, this is from uh, a Biden ally here, is that some of this, right, some of these quotes around the memory, around the president's age, it gets at pre-existing notions that are already being discussed, that are already evident in polling that voters have concerns about, that are already very much at the tip of the spear for Republicans' attacks on President Biden. It, it is getting to that exact point, right? And you are seeing even tonight Republicans trying to capitalize on that. We mentioned at the top of the show that House Republican leadership, unsurprisingly, is out with a report or out with a statement calling this disturbing. We're also hearing from former President Trump, right? Talk us through that piece of it. Yeah, absolutely. This has been a problem uh, with the Biden campaign since, really, the president uh, announced he was running for re-election. And it's a problem that the White House and the Biden campaign have tried uh, to walk over, to try to clear up. We heard even Corrine Jean-Pierre talk in today's White House press briefing, trying to clear up uh, the gaffes that the president has made uh, in recent days. And this is essentially a gift for pres former President Trump as he campaigns for re-election and tries to seize upon this lack of enthusiasm, this gap in enthusiasm that we're seeing the Biden campaign struggle with. I want to mention uh, a statement uh, that former President Trump released reacting to this report in which he says in part, quote, this has now proven to be a two-tiered system of justice and unconstitutional selective prosecution. The Biden documents case is 100 times different and more severe than mine. I did nothing wrong, and I cooperated far more. He continues by saying, what Biden did is outrageously criminal, Hallie. So just some initial reaction uh, from former President Trump. You can imagine how his campaign will absolutely seize on what is mentioned in this report and try to weaponize it uh, against uh, President Biden, Hallie. 
Ali Raff outside the White House. Ken, that brings me back to you here, right? Because while former President Trump may say that he cooperated far more objectively based on the facts that we know as laid out by the Department of Justice in both the special counsel report and the indictment against the former president, that is not the case. That he, the, the allegations go, repeatedly tried to prevent investigators from getting access to those documents that had been at Mar-a-Lago there. That's just one of the distinctions that the special counsel in this instance, Robert Hur, is noting, right? That's right, Hallie. These cases are not even in the same universe. And hmm. special counsel Robert Hur didn't have to point that out. He really went beyond his writ. He did a public service, though, because he knew these comparisons were going to be made. Right. And so he took time. He sort of put a pause on his discussion of Mr. Biden's conduct and said, by the way, this is completely different from President Trump's case, because he was talking about the context of other presidents who had kept classified information. And it's all of a piece. And what Biden did was not much different from what, as I described before, what Ronald Reagan did in some respects. But what, but her said that what Mr. Trump did was markedly different because he refused to give back documents that were requested first by the archives, then by law enforcement. And then he is accused of obstructing justice by ordering subordinates to destroy evidence and then lie about it. That's a hugely significant mm. allegation quite apart from the issue of classified information, not to mention the volume of classified material that Mr. Trump allegedly retained and the seriousness of it going to nuclear issues and, uh, you know, interactions with foreign leaders it appears to go beyond what her is saying Mr. Biden took in this case. Ken Delaney, and thank you so much. Danny Savalos, you have the patience of a saint, and I'm excited to talk with you about your perspective on this, because as Ken points out, and as Ali knows, the decision not to charge here seems to be based on the idea the prosecutor, prosecutors didn't think they could actually get a jury to convict. Do you think that was the right conclusion? I do, if they believe they couldn't get a conviction. Frankly, that is the proper analysis for a, specifically a federal prosecutor. They should consider whether or not they could get a conviction. But how they arrived at that was a surprise. And in fact, of this multi-hundred page document, the biggest surprise for me came down to one word. And that word was willful. As we were waiting this report, I did expect that it would conclude that Biden had retained these documents, but that it hadn't been willful, because willful is the key to criminality in these classified and other national secret documents cases. So that when the report concluded that he retained them willfully, they essentially made out the elements of several different crimes that relate to keeping and retaining classified documents. More than willful, it found that he disseminated them and did so presumably willfully. So this is a scathing indictment that is everything short of an indictment. Now, you asked about the decision not to charge. It, this is not a, a report that concludes exoneration. This is a report that focuses on mitigation for its reasons not to charge. Again, that's a good thing. That's what prosecutors are supposed to do. Uh, but the mitigation is really just a thinly veiled insult against the president. I mean, it's about uh, how doddering he is, how he can't remember things. And I just have to say, as an aside, as a criminal defense attorney, uh, I can't think of another time that a prosecutor sat down with a potential defendant and said, well, you know what? He doesn't seem to remember the crime, so I guess we're done here. That, that part seems a little strange to me, but look, that's what they concluded in the report. It's not about whether they think yeah. he committed a crime. It's more about whether they think they could prove their case. It's also interesting that we didn't hear, we sort of heard a passing reference to the complications in terms of charging a sitting president. That was something that came up with Donald Trump and Robert Mueller, just to, just to go back down memory lane a little bit there. Did that strike you? Uh, yes and no. I mean, I, I was surprised that they even related it to Trump's case at all, because I thought they would just do a straight analysis of whether yeah. or not there was criminality in this particular set of factual circumstances. But I think the reason they did compare it to Biden's situation is the notion that Donald Trump, as we've already been talking about, uh, resisted, uh, may have concealed documents, may have obstructed justice, because so much of the intent behind these crimes goes to what was your intent when you had those documents. Now, what you do afterwards in letting prosecutors look at your stuff doesn't really go to the intent you had when you took the documents, but it kind of does, uh, because then you can later argue that, hey, I had no idea. I'm as surprised as you are. And that was Biden's approach. That, again, is why I'm shocked that the report concluded that his retention was willful and not inadvertent. Danny Savalos, thank you so much. A lot to think about, a lot to sift through today. Appreciate you being with us. And it's only the beginning, right? Because I want to take you over to the Supreme Court, where there seems to be an answer to a question the justices have never faced before. Can a state...
kick a president off the ballot or a former president off the ballot? And from what we heard today, at least from the tea leaves, the signs point to, well, no. It's part of this historic case bought by voters in Colorado saying Donald Trump cannot run this year. This is their allegation. They say he cannot run. They took him off the ballot because of his push to overturn his 2020 election loss. It's connected to this Civil War amendment that you see here, which was designed to prevent Confederate rebels from holding office ever again. Basically, you can't be an insurrectionist and also president is what it comes down to. So what seems to be persuading the justices now that Mr. Trump should be on the ballot in Colorado? First, there is this question of whether the former president or any president is an officer of the United States. That matters because of the phrasing in the Constitution and the different oaths that different officials take. Colorado's lawyers say, yeah, that Mr. Trump violated voters' rights. Listen. The reason we're here is that President Trump tried to disenfranchise 80 million Americans who voted against him, and the Constitution doesn't require that he be given another chance. But Mr. Trump's attorneys are going hard on another piece of this, whether Mr. Trump actually engaged in an insurrection. They don't think so. This was a riot. It was not an insurrection. The events were shameful, criminal, violent, all of those things, but it did not qualify as insurrection, as that term is used in Section 3. Then there's the question of whether it's actually up to Congress to pass a law that would kick Donald Trump off the ballot. Like, that's the avenue this whole thing would have to go through, the national path, just the state of Colorado versus, right? So is it national or is it state? And interestingly, it was one of the justices on the liberal side who seemed open to this argument from Mr. Trump's attorneys. I think that the question that you have to confront is why a single state should decide who gets to be president of the United States. In other words, you know, this question of whether a former president is disqualified for insurrection uh, to be president again is, you know, just say it, it sounds awfully national to me. And then there's this last one. Does this whole thing apply to people running for office or just people already in office? That matters, obviously, since Donald Trump is running for president. He is not yet president. Yumi Shalcindor is outside the Supreme Court for us here in Washington. Feels like an uphill battle for Colorado's legal team, right? Because justices across the ideological spectrum seem skeptical. Talk us through it. Certainly sounds like an uphill battle. Of course, this is the Supreme Court that is a 6-3 conservative majority, but but, but justices on both sides, both liberal and conservative, sounded really, really skeptical that Colorado as one state could decide whether or not former President Trump could be taken off that Republican primary ballot. I want to play some sound for you of Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson, as well as Justice Brett Kavanaugh, a, re a Republican, someone who was someone that was at least appointed by a Republican, and someone that was supported by a Democrat. Take a listen. Well, when you look at Section three, the term insurrection jumps out. And the question is, the questions are, what does that mean? How do you define it? Who decides? Who decides whether someone engaged in it? I guess my question is why the framers would have designed a system that would, could result in interim disuniformity in this way, where we have elections pending and different states suddenly saying, you are eligible, you're not. Now, despite the justices sounding skeptical, there were robust arguments on both sides. A lawyer for Donald Trump was saying that really none of this, the Section 3 uh, of the 14th Amendment, does not at all apply to him and that he should be allowed to be on the ballot. But you had lawyers for Colorado saying just the opposite, saying, in fact, he was an insurrectionist who tried to disenfranchise voters and that he should not be allowed to be on the ballot. Hallie? So then let's get into the politics, because we heard from former President Trump today. Let me play some of that. I think it was well received. I hope it was well received. You have millions of people that are out there wanting to vote, and they happen to want to vote for me or the Republican Party or whatever you want to, however you want to phrase it. But I'm the one running. As Justice Kagan said, a ruling here would not just affect Colorado, it would affect basically every state as we're getting closer and closer to the election. Well, Hallie, what was really interesting here is that the justices spent a lot of time talking about the consequences of what this decision would mean, even more so than they did talking about insurrection, even more so than they did talking about the specific Constitution. So it really was very clear that politics were on people's minds here. And if we could put up a map for folks, you can see why they're talking about this, because there are a number of states across the country that are looking at whether or not former President Trump should be struck in from the ballot. And you see a number of them have been dismissed, but a number of them, those blue ones, are pending. So this decision will definitely have consequences. I also 
want to point out that there are some Republican officials in red states who are saying if, in fact, former President Trump were to lose this case in front of the Supreme Court, they might move to remove President Biden from the ballot. So that really tells you already that there's going to be this political back and forth if this case is decided one way or the other, Hallie. Yamish Elsendor live for us there outside the Supreme Court as the sun is setting here in Washington. Lots to get through, Yamish. Thank you so much. Let's take you overseas now where Iraq is publicly criticizing the U.S. after that retaliatory drone strike that killed a senior Iran-backed militia commander, calling the attack in Baghdad, in their words, a clear-cut assassination operation. The Pentagon says that commander who was killed was directly responsible for months of attacks on U.S. military bases in the region including, of course, the attack on a base in Jordan that killed three U.S. service members. I want to bring in Raf Sanchez live for us in Tel Aviv. And Raf, one of the things that you and I talked about when this strike initially happened, this, this second retaliatory strike 24 hours ago, was the, the, the sort of Iraqi fallout component of this, because they were not notified, we understand, from a U.S. official until after the strike happened. Now we are hearing the response. They are not happy, and that is not surprising. Talk us through it. They're not happy, Hallie. Their initial wave of American strikes inside of Iraq took place in the desert in the west of the country, in Anbar province. What happened yesterday, very different. This was a strike in the heart of the Iraqi capital. It happened in front of large crowds of people, many of whom were immediately filming the aftermath on their cell phones. They were chanting, America is Satan as they stood around that burning car. And this is putting fresh strain on the relationship between Baghdad and Washington. There are still a lot of American troops inside of Iraq, Cali, and they are there on part of the counter ISIS mission to make sure that that jihadist group doesn't regroup, doesn't regather. And they need the cooperation of the Iraqi government. And the Iraqi government is in a very difficult situation right now where they feel like they are being humiliated again and again by the United States, who are carrying out strikes inside of their territory, not telling them when these strikes are going to happen. And of course, they are caught to a certain degree between the U.S., a major partner for them, a major supplier of military aid, economic aid, but also Iran, their very powerful neighbor right next door, who controls, to a certain extent, a lot of these militant groups that are running around in Iraqi territory. It's this paradoxical situation, Hallie. A lot of these Iranian-backed militants are technically part of the Iraqi armed forces, and that's why you saw the Iraqi prime minister visiting some of them at their hospital beds following that initial wave of American strikes. So a very complicated situation in Iraq right now. Hallie. Raf Sanchez live for us in the region. Raf, thank you. Back here at home, we're learning tonight that three bodies have been found after a family of six, including three children, were involved in a shooting and a fire at their home outside of Philly. Officials are now saying that fire may have been set on purpose. Two police officers were shot at the scene, too. Both of them are expected to recover. You're seeing some of it here. You see the fire is still burning. Police have been trying to search the house all day, but they've been moving slowly because they're worried it could collapse. I want to get to George Solis, who is on the ground for us in East Lansdowne, PA. What else are we learning tonight, George? It seems like some of these late-breaking details are just coming in. Yeah, that's right, Hallie. This has been an ever-evolving story and an unusual one. And we kind of want to reset the scene here because there are so many moving parts to this. Keep in mind, Please. about 24 hours ago, authorities got to the home here in East Lansdowne after reports of a 911 call that an 11-year-old had been shot. The authorities get here. They immediately encounter gunfire. They say the shooter retreats into the home. Shortly thereafter, a big blaze leading to those dramatic images of that fire. That fire burning for several hours because authorities could not knocked down this fire. Those firefighters could have knocked down the fire because there was concern that there was an active shooter. Eventually, they're all clear is given, and now there's that concern that the structural uh, integrity of the property is, is gone. And so the DA earlier today saying, like, look, we're not going to send our guys in there right away until we know it is safe and sound. Initially, the DA saying, look, we've now recovered one body and a rifle. A little bit later this afternoon, we're hearing now three bodies recovered from the scene. We're hearing that authorities are actually pausing the rest of the recovery efforts until tomorrow. Not sure if that's more to do with the lighting starting to get darker here or if they just want to re regroup uh, into the after uh, afternoon, into the early evening hours. The other side of that, those officers that were wounded here when responding to the 911 call, one of them was actually released from the hospital today. So there was a big uh, celebratory ceremony at the hospital, Penn Presbyterian, about 20 minutes from here, where law enforcement agencies from around the region 
came to see him off. The other one, uh, maybe some time before he is released. But again, this is all sort of late breaking, and it's just one of many moving parts with this investigation. The DA, uh, Jack Stolzheimer, re revealing that the family that lived at the home was identified as the Lee family, three children, three adults, but stopping short of identifying the shooter or his connection to the family. And I believe we have a little bit of, uh, of an interview we did with the DA earlier today. Uh, here's what he had to say. We have found the torso of one individual, and we've recovered one rifle uh, at this point. But there is a lot more work to be done. I can't even begin to tell your estimate how long it's going to take for us to continue to do that work. It's a very unsafe scene. Yeah, and Hallie, as I mentioned, uh, we now know that that totals up to three uh, recovery uh, bodies recovered here at the scene. And again, they're pausing the search efforts for tonight to resume tomorrow. And that is the latest here from the scene, Hallie. George Solis, live for us there, just uh, outside Philly. George, thank you very much for being with us and for handling what is just a fast-moving situation there. Appreciate it. Lots more coming up here on the show, including the plane fender bender at an airport today, raising some questions about why this kind of thing keeps happening. Plus, a volcano in Iceland, look at this, erupting yet again near one of the country's biggest tourist hotspots. We've got a live look at that in just a sec. I want to show you here Boston's airport, Logan, today, where two jet blue planes kind of collided, basically brushing each other's wings while they were on the tarmac. You can see how close they got here, part of one wing touching another plane's tail section. So they were getting de-iced there in that section under the control of the airline, by the way, of JetBlue. Passengers say they didn't know what was going on. Nobody was hurt, but both flights were canceled. JetBlue says the planes were taken out of service to be fixed. All of it coming with a lot of spotlight, if you will, an intense spotlight, some concerns about flying here in the U.S. because of a serious shortage of air traffic controllers. The FAA is now racing to staff up and train a new generation of them. Our Tom Costello got a very rare behind-the-scenes look at the training academy. It's an academy, Tom, that you and I have talked about before because they're trying to get these folks trained. You don't snap your fingers and have people ready to go do air no. traffic controlling. It takes a minute. It's a steep learning curve, and uh, the reason that they need to add more controllers as fast as possible is because there's a mandatory retirement age for controllers of 56, all right, 56, sure. and they simply don't have enough right now, and they can't train enough fast enough. In fact, take a look at the graphics here about how quickly they're trying to and what the problem is here. Uh, right now, they say, according to the FAA, that they have a shortage of a about, there are the numbers, 1,300 more controllers needed according to the FAA. However, the union says, no, 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 it's more than that. 3,500 are needed, in fact. Uh, but here's the deal. We, show you the, we will show you the video from the Air Traffic Control Academy. The washout rate, 30% uh, at the academy, 30%. It's not easy. And then after that, they go to control towers and another 30% drop out. This is not an easy job. Why? in part because once you do start getting on the job, it is, in fact, a, a long day. It is mandatory overtime. It is uh, often six-day weeks. On top of that, you have to work holidays. you got to mm. work your weekends, and it's stressful. And so the focus at the Air Traffic Control Academy is getting this next generation in. So did you hear that reflected in some of the folks you spoke with? Like, did you hear concerns about the potential for burnout, the high stress? Absolutely. Or were people, tell me about that. Absolutely. And here's what's fascinating. I talked to the guy who's in charge of all air traffic control uh, operations nationwide, and he was at the academy. And I said, what makes a good new controller? What makes a good student? What quali qualities yeah. makes a good student? Here's what he said. Who are you looking to recruit? Give me your idea of what kind of experience does somebody need? Those, those people that grow up gaming, those people that have that ability to see three-dimensional, you know, and again, to think three to four to five steps ahead. That is the type of person that it takes to do this job. Did you hear what he said? Video yeah. gamers. Isn't that funny? Twenty-somethings who are video gamers, they are really good at this job. They think multidimensionally. They can anticipate, okay, if this Fast. goes wrong, I'm yeah. going to do X, Y, Z, multiple steps ahead. And they're not, they're not intimidated by massive amounts of data and computer imagery coming at you at once. 
I love that. Tom Costello, what a rare and interesting inside look at how this all comes together. Thank you so much for being NBC Nightly News. We'll see. Well, you're beat, you want to read my prompter here? Because oh, we're no, about oh, to say it. Oh, good? We Thank sure you. are. That's Please right, do. friend. Yes. Look at this graphic we built for you, too. <laughs> Nightly News, 6.30 Eastern with more of Tom's reporting. Thank you. Thank you, friend. Appreciate okay. it. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, over in Ukraine, the president there, Volodymyr Zelensky, says he's replacing his top general in a big shakeup now and months of reported tension over strategy. Right now, Ukraine's counteroffensive is struggling against Russia as Russia is stepping up its attacks, too. Number two, the CDC is now investigating that mysterious GI illness we told you about on a luxury cruise ship where more than 150 people say they're sick. They're throwing up, they have diarrhea. We still don't really know why. The cruise line tells the CDC the ship is cleaning more and trying to isolate people who are not feeling well. Number three, a volcano, look at this, in Iceland today, erupting for the third time in just the last two months. The pictures are incredible. You see lava there, 150 feet into the sky, but on the ground, it is really inconvenient. They had to evacuate one of Iceland's biggest tourist attractions, you know, the Blue Lagoon Spa. You've probably seen it on TikTok, on your Insta. They had to cut off heat and hot water for thousands of people because of this thing. It's one that we're watching. Number two, Zillow is now letting people search for individual rooms to rent, kind of like Airbnb, where you can look for rooms or a whole place. It seems to be symbolic of a bigger struggle right now of renters having a tough time finding a place to live that they can actually afford. Already on Zillow, there are something like 10,000 of these room listings coast to coast. Number five, the new Paris Olympics medals have a secret, you could say ingredient, the Eiffel Tower. Not, not a picture of it, it's actually in it. Olympians are gonna take home little pieces of the Eiffel Tower embedded in every single metal, gold, silver, bronze that's given out this summer. If you're like, wait a second, how's that possible? It's metal that was taken out of the tower during renovations. So that's what's gonna be in these, these awards, if you will. Organizers called this the cherry on top of winning some kind of hardware at the games. When we come back. Muslim Americans making up a small but strong voting block in this coming election. And this year, it's not super clear who they will ultimately be supporting in the presidential race, who some of them will be. That could mean some big consequences for some of the candidates. Plus, charges for a Florida man, look at this, for doing this, we'll explain. In the next hour, we expect to get an update from the Marines after learning five Marines died after their helicopter went missing in a forest in California. We told you about this mission on this show 24 hours ago. It is now not a search and rescue, but a recovery. In a statement, President Biden says we are mourning this profound loss and we honor their selfless service and ultimate sacrifice. Dana Griffin is live for us in Pine Valley, California. In just the, late, in just the last couple of hours, we've heard the Pentagon get asked some questions on some of these helicopter safety concerns with this particular type of chopper mm -hmm. here. Walk us through what we know and the expectation is we expect this update pretty soon. Yeah, Hallie, and I think a lot of uh, the reason why we're getting a lot of those questions is because there was a similar crash not too far from this location in 2018 that killed four Marines. And we know that the families settled with the manufacturers and suppliers that supplied parts to the, to the military. So the question is about safety and the concerns of what went wrong. These particular helicopters are designed to fly in terrible weather. They're designed to fly at night. So there is a question of what could have gone wrong. We know that weather will likely be something that investigators look at because there was snow, there was wind in this area when that crash went down. You mentioned Major General Ryder's comments. He said this earlier today during a Pentagon press briefing. Listen. They will, as always, continue to look at their training, maintenance, and safety programs to ensure that we learn from every incident and apply those lessons into their risk management programs and management of those fleets. So we know right now this is an active recovery mission. So we've been to the site as far as we can go where some of those Marines are still stepping out on foot to recover their fallen teammates, their fallen Marines. No word yet on if they've recovered the bodies of those five Marines, but we are standing by hoping to get an update. As you mentioned, there is a 3.30 p.m. local time press conference, and maybe they'll reveal new details. We've already learned that they won't release the names of those Marines until tomorrow. It's military protocol to do that 
24 hours after next of kin have been notified. But we did receive a statement from the commanding officer of these fallen Marines who writes in part to the families of our fallen Marines. We send our deepest condolences and commit to ensuring your support and care during this incredibly difficult time. Though we understand the inherent risks of military service, any loss of life is always difficult. And Holly, I just want to sh share just how how hard this is hitting the community. We spoke to a woman who was just sitting on the side of the road. Her daughter is a is a military member, not involved in this particular crash, but she was so concerned and so moved. She brought pizzas here so mm. that the crew behind us could eat. And she sat in her car and cried because knowing that her daughter does something similar and puts her life at risk, it just shows the concern for people, even if you don't know who was yeah. on that flight you have a love and concern for the people who risk their lives every day for our country. Hallie. Dana Griffin hits so close to home for her, for that community, but for so many across the country. Thank you. Top aides for President Biden are heading to Michigan tonight to meet with some Arab American and Muslim leaders as President Biden, also, by the way, candidate Biden, remember, tries to shore up support from this voting bloc. He's facing more and more backlash because of his support for Israel, which has deepened its siege on Gaza. Our Yasmin Vesuvian has more. Tonight, a spotlight on one of the main issues facing voters in this election. I will stand with Israel 100 percent. Give them whatever they need, whenever they need it, no questions asked. You don't have to be a Jew to be a Zionist. Bipartisan support for Israel, leaving some from one key voting bloc feeling abandoned by both parties, Muslim Americans. American Muslims, Arab Americans, and many American uh, voters who support the Palestinians are intensely angry and disillusioned with the policy of President Biden. There are about 8 million Muslims in the United States, and the group is a small yet mighty voting force. 71% of them turned out to vote in 2020, but now many feel like they're being forced to make a tough choice. So who would you vote for? Well, there is a third option, no vote. More than two-thirds of Muslim Americans voted for President Joe Biden in 2020. But that could change this year, with some making calls to, quote, abandon Biden altogether. If Joe Biden cannot see us, you can count us out in November. Some saying they're upset with President Biden bypassing Congress twice to deliver emergency military aid to Israel, meanwhile providing $121 million in humanitarian assistance to Gaza. But they're not favoring Republicans either, according to recent Democratic polling of Michigan by Lake Research Partners. This wouldn't be the first time we saw such a large swing for Muslim American voters. In 2000, 72 percent of the group voted for then-candidate George W. Bush. But just four years later, that's 72 percent turning into less than 1 percent. After September 11, George W. Bush became a different president. The surveillance of the American Muslim community, the loss of civil liberties, the Democratic Party at least promised to challenge that uh, injustice. And in 2024, they say they feel left behind again. They will tip the elections, especially in the major battleground states. In the 2020 race, Biden won in Michigan by just 150,000 votes, a swing state with one of the largest Muslim populations in the country. In the Michigan precincts with the highest concentration of Muslim and Arab Americans, 83 percent of the vote went to Biden. Now, only 16 percent say they'd vote for him in 2024. Almost all give the president's response to the Israel-Hamas war a, quote, poor rating. The Biden campaign says they'll continue to engage in conversations with the Arab American community, even if they disagree on policy decisions. And the Trump campaign says the former president had, quote, peace in the Middle East in his last term. The Haley campaign has not responded to our request for comment. As many Arab Americans and Muslim Americans face a difficult decision, experts warn if they don't show up to the polls, it could have a major impact on this year's election. Yasmin Vesugian, NBC News. Our thanks to Yasmin for that story. NBC News covers hundreds of other stories every day. And because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Western Bureau, the Justice Department arresting five people in connection with an international drug trafficking ring based in California. Look at this. They say almost 100 packages of meth were hidden inside these books, like scraped out, hollowed out books and some dolls. Look at that. Ugh worth more than $20 million. The suspects are facing multiple charges.
Out of our Southern Bureau, police in Florida have arrested a man for allegedly trying to surf in his pickup truck, they said. You can't, bro, you need a surfboard for that one, man. He said, it's not my fault this truck don't surf. That's what he told police, according to police. There you go. There's this piece of metal on the roof of a house that one family in Philly says they found. Kind of a flat metal thing with a hole cut out of it. They thought maybe it was part of a door that fell from a plane. They called the FAA. Turns out it's not from any known aircraft, but they're still looking into it. Coming up here on the show, that one-time border bill now just has money in it for aid like Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan. We'll be talking to one senator about it in our newsmaker in just a minute. Back here to Washington now, where there is perhaps, maybe, possibly the faintest of heartbeats in the Senate's now borderless border bill after they passed a key procedural vote of this really slimmed down bill, a bill that doesn't include the border stuff, right? It's got everything else you see here, money for Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan, humanitarian aid to Gaza, a new plan to try to fight the spread of deadly fentanyl. But here's the thing, this bill still has a whole bunch of hurdles to jump over before a final vote that would send it over to the House. I want to bring in Democratic Senator from Colorado, Michael Bennett, who is joining us now. Senator, thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks, Hallie, for having me back. It's there good to has see you. been, of course, there's been a ton of drama where you're standing over the course of the last few days on both sides of the Capitol. Well, on the Senate side, your colleague across the aisle, Rand Paul, said earlier today he would object to anything speeding up what he described as this rotten foreign spending bills passage. So, your point, I know, is that some of these countries desperately need aid. How much longer are they going to have to wait? Well, hopefully they're not going to have to wait longer than this weekend to get it through the Senate, Hallie. We've got now um, uh, 17 Republicans joining the Democrats. So we've got, I think, 50, almost two, or two thirds of the Senate saying we should move forward with this bill. Ukraine is literally out of bullets. And over the last two years, they've, they've achieved uh, so much more than anybody could have imagined pushing Putin back. And they've stood up not just for themselves, but for democracy, for NATO, for us. And this is a critical moment when our resolve is being tested, when American leadership uh, is in the balance. And we've got to get it done this weekend. Of course, even if we get it done, then there's mm. the whole issue of getting it through the House of Representatives. You've pointed out that there's $60 billion in money for Ukraine hanging in the balance here. You've described how, as you say, they're basically out of bullets here. You've done things like, you know, trying to get the Senate focused on that, um, doing some things like holding up government funding and money for the FAA, countless right. lengthy floor speeches, et cetera. Do you believe your tactics move the needle at all to get where we are tonight? I think we have moved. Uh, you know, there were times over the last four months when, if you talk to people around here, they thought it was a fait accompli. That, uh, that we were that our broken politics just weren't going to let this happen. And the argument that I've been trying to make, I think others have been trying to make, is that Putin's had real trouble on the battlefield here and that the Ukrainians taking back half of the territory, uh, li giving their lives for democracy, uh, deserve better than our broken politics. They've set an example that's inspired the rest of the world. And I think it's beginning to inspire people here as well that don't want to leave that don't want to leave Ukraine in the lurch. And I think Putin knows how to read our newspapers. He knows how divided we are. He knows how dysfunctional we are. He believes that democracy saw our finest hour in the 20th century. Xi Jinping thinks the same thing. This is an opportunity for us to show uh, something very different, that democracy is alive and kicking, that we have the inspiration of the Ukrainian people mm. who have fought this tyrant back and that we're not going to let them down. And I think we are not going to let them down, uh, uh, notwithstanding all of the anguish and aggravation and, and insanity that it's taken us to finally get to this, to this weekend. To, to the point that you're making here, when you talk about aggravation and insanity, I think there are people who are watching this, who are watching the work that your chamber is doing, going, can Congress actually get anything done? Can they? Yeah. Well, Putin's saying Congress can't get anything done. As I said, he's counting on that. And I think what we're going to find out is that maybe the outer edge of our failure is the Ukraine funding. In other words, mm. that we're going to say we're going to step back from the brink and say that's a bridge too far. We're not going to screw that up. Our kids and our grandkids deserve better than that. 
We have just shown a serious breakdown when it comes to the border. We could not come. We came to a bipartisan agreement at the insistence of the Republicans who wanted this as part of Ukraine. Then they walked away from it. You know, I represent a pretty purple state, Hallie, mm -hmm. and Republicans and Democrats and independents would like to see us have a functional immigration system. They know the one we have today is broken. Uh, my view of that is, look, let's get the Ukraine stuff done. Let's get the other funding done here, and then maybe we can go back and have a discussion about about immigration without it holding a gun to everybody's head and do improve you, the system for the American people. Do you think that conversation can happen on the border on immigration this calendar year, this election year, realistically? It, well, it's going to be really hard with, with a presidential candidate in the form of Donald Trump saying that his election chances are going to be hurt if Joe Biden never reaches a bipartisan deal on the border. You know, we've seen a complete collapse in the last week for that very reason. Uh, but uh, but hope springs eternal. We can continue to try. I think in the meantime, Joe Biden is going to be able to make the case that he saw that we've got a, some serious issues at the border because the, of the way transnational gangs have been smuggling people uh, over the last five, five years or so to that border, making billions and billions of dollars. And he said, look, I don't want transnational gangs in charge of that. And I brought a serious proposal to the Congress and the Republicans walked away. I can guarantee you this, Hallie, Donald Trump's not going to make our immigration system better. And I think Joe Biden's going to be able to make this case in this election, not just on immigration, but the economy as well. And, and hopefully, as a result, uh, have another four years. So then let's talk about that election. Let's talk about the next four years, because by now I'm sure you've seen the special counsel's report about President Biden and his handling of classified documents here, a report that in several instances describes him having issues with his memory, his mental state, saying that they were concerned, they have considered that the president would likely present himself as a well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. You mentioned you are from a pretty purple state, Senator, as you yourself said. Do you have concerns about the about what you have seen and heard based on this special counsel report? Uh, I haven't had a chance to read the report, but I'm not going to dodge what you read. I, he I heard what you read. Um, it's not consistent with the conversations that I've had with the president. I do wish that elected leaders in this country would learn how to treat classified material. I, I'm on the Intelligence Committee and, you know, the Republicans and Democrats on that committee take our responsibilities apparently a lot more seriously than others do um, when it comes to protecting that, that, that information. But there's nothing to compare the way President Biden responded when those documents showed up at his house and he, and he invited the, the lawyers in. He turned it all over to the Justice Department. Donald Trump still won't admit that the documents that he took, he even took. So this is another case where there's just n no comparison between these two individuals. President Biden's attorneys have argued that they believe it was not appropriate for the special counsel to reference repeatedly some of the things that came up related to the president's age, related to the president's memory. Do you think it was inappropriate for the special counsel to include that in his final report? Uh, uh, that's not a judgment I can make, Hallie. But I do think the president, look, the, the, the American people know that the president is not the youngest president that we have, that we've had. And and we know that that's an issue of concern among the American people. And I believe the president of the United States, as he campaigns uh, into the fall, is going to be able to stand up well against Donald Trump, who, by the way, is the same age as Joe Biden, and make the case that that he's been able to not just uh, not just win a political campaign against Donald Trump, which he did, but accomplish some of the most significant things that any president has in modern in our modern lifetimes, including a bipartisan infrastructure bill, including uh, leading the international order in this war against Putin and a bunch of other stuff in between. He's obviously going to have to take that case to the American people and make that case mm -hmm. to the American people. And I'm confident he'll be able to do it. Senator Michael Bennett, we're glad to have you on tonight as our newsmaker. Thanks here for on having the show. me. Thank you very Thank much you, for Hallie. staying late. I appreciate it. Breaking news, no charges against President Biden after a special counsel investigation into his mishandling of classified documents. But bigger fallout may come politically, with the report calling into question his memory and mental state. 
fierce pushback from Biden allies tonight. We're going to take you live to our team, fanned out across all of it with more on how we got here and what comes next. Plus, the other big news from here in Washington, major arguments in front of the Supreme Court today about whether one state can kick Donald Trump off the ballot this year, why the justices seem to be leaning toward letting him run. And Vladimir Putin sitting down for a highly anticipated interview with Western media, a first since Russia invaded Ukraine. The interviewer, none other than Tucker Carlson, what we're hearing tonight from that interview, and what it means for Carlson. Then developing in just the last hour, three bodies have been found connected to a shooting and fire at a home outside Philadelphia. Why officials say that fire may have been set on purpose when we take you live to the scene. Plus, more on what's behind this close call at Boston's airport today. You see it here a little bit later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and we are coming on the air tonight with President Biden cleared of criminal charges for mishandling classified documents. So legally, legally out of the woods. But politically, maybe that's a different story. After this scathing report described him over nearly 400 pages, in some instances as what they say, an elderly man, a well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory, suggesting no jury would convict the president for holding on to these documents, citing instances when the special counsel says the president was forgetful. Remember, this was the material found in the president's Delaware home and Washington office from years ago, from back during his time as vice president. Now, the special counsel, Robert Hur, says while the president willfully held on to some of that stuff and told somebody else about them, his ghostwriter, saying in 2017 he had just found all the classified stuff downstairs, they're not intending to prosecute. The documents were found in a badly damaged box next to a bunch of, like, random household stuff. And if you're thinking, well, wait a second, Donald Trump did get charged for his mishandling of classified documents. So why not Biden? Well, the special counsel is preempting that question, pointing out some big differences between these two cases, saying that when President Biden's staff discovered these documents, they were turned over right away to investigators. They were voluntarily allowed to go and search the property. On the flip side, the special counsel points out, former President Trump's accused of keeping the documents, even after being asked repeatedly to hand them over, and then allegedly obstructing justice by asking his staff to destroy evidence and then lie about it to the point where there needed to be a search warrant executed at Mar-a-Lago. So now, while President Biden's attorneys are praising the decision not to charge him on one hand, on the other hand, they're also slamming the special counsel for the comments about the president's memory and mental state that they say are not only not accurate, but not appropriate. Here's the president himself in just the last couple of hours. Special counsel acknowledged I cooperated completely. I did not throw up any roadblocks. I sought no delays. In fact, I was so determined to give special counsel what they needed I went forward with a five-hour in-person interview over the two days of October the 9th, 8th and 9th. I want to bring in uh, our team coverage on this. NBC's Ken Delaney, who is joining us now. Ali Rafa is posted up near the White House. Our legal analyst, Danny Savalos, is here as well. And Ken, we talked about these memory issues cited by the special counsel. It seems to be one of the core reasons why he's not going to face criminal charges. Help us explain that, that if the special counsel says he willfully kept the documents, why they're deciding not to bring forth a prosecution. Right, Hallie, and it, it's in part because Mr. Biden said he couldn't remember. For example, there was a damning piece of evidence that Mr. Biden made a recording in 2017 speaking to a ghostwriter working on a memoir where he said he found classified documents in the house in Virginia where he was staying. Now, on its face, that is really incriminating because then it raises the question, well, why didn't you report it at the time? Have you been holding on to those classified documents? That goes against the narrative that, oh, as soon as we discovered them, we turned them over to the FBI. But what Mr. Biden said was he quickly forgot about that. And so in order to explain why that factored into not bringing the charges and, and why Rob Herb was trying to say, look, I can't successfully get a conviction here, he had to get into Mr. Biden's faulty memory. And so he went into great detail about what he perceived as and, and described as Mr. Biden's memory lapses during their five and a half hour interview, including saying that Mr. Biden couldn't remember when he was vice president, couldn't remember the date when his son Bo died, and couldn't remember um, which side of a particular argument he was on in Afghanistan. And, and that was described as more than just simply, you know, the forgetfulness of an 81 year old man. And, and what, he, what Rob Hurst said was, you put this person in front of a jury, they're going to see sort of a forgetful elderly person who's very sympathetic. And that's so that even though Mr. Biden's allies are saying those were gratuitous, what uh, the special mm. counsel would say is we had to put that stuff in there to explain why to explain, we're not charging right. him in the face of this incriminating information. 
Well, Allie, to that point, Ken, stand by. I mean, they are saying that it's gratuitous in so many words, right? You have the president's attorneys pushing back on the inclusion of some of these references that Ken alluded to, to the president's memory, mental state, et cetera. Talk about the rebuttal from the White House, because we have some new reporting from those close to the president on that. Talk to us. Yeah, absolutely, Hallie. Uh, the president's attorneys are downplaying these mentions in hers report. They're saying in a letter that was included in this nearly 400-page document uh, that in part, a quote, the president's inability to recall dates or details of events that happened years ago is neither surprising nor unusual. Yet unlike your treatment of President Biden, your report accepts other witnesses' memory loss as completely understandable given the passage of time. And they go on to say uh, that they're requesting that her revisits his descriptions of the president's memory and revise them so they are stated in a manner that is within the bounds of your expertise and remit. So that is extremely notable, Hallie. The president's lawyers asking the special counsel to go back and essentially rewrite what they are calling these inaccurate uh, descriptions. And they're especially notable because of what we know has been a struggle for the president and his campaign. Uh, these, these struggles among especially young voters uh, to have faith in the president and his ability to serve uh, a second term. Some people are uh, concerned that he is not mentally fit enough. So as we uh, see the White House try to counter that and really turn its, uh, that argument on its head, we've se seen them countless amounts of times uh, trying to use the president's age as an advantage, we're now seeing uh, the campaign try to downplay those concerns as well, saying that those age concerns have been, uh, are nothing new. This is something that has happened for years, and we've proven time and time again uh, that they shouldn't be a concern for the American people. But no doubt, Hallie, this is presenting a challenge for the Biden campaign as it tries to, for one thing, win over uh, young voters for November. Mm -hmm. Real quick, Ali, because we heard the president allude to the fact that he sat for interviews with the special counsel during which some of these, obviously, these quotes are from, on October 8th and 9th, noting that that was in the hours after the October 7th Hamas terror attack on Israel, so the early hours of the Israel-Hamas war there. Why is it that the president is bringing that up? Connect those dots there. Yeah, we heard the president uh, in the last couple hours say that he was extremely cooperative and communicative with the special counsel's office, especially during those interviews that he said uh, lasted hours and they were conducted, as you said, in the aftermath of uh, the uh, Hamas's attack on Israel. And it's believed to be this the president trying to, as you mentioned, connect the dots between what was going on in the world at the time, all of the different responsibilities that he was undertaking, uh, and how chaotic and busy he was, uh, seemingly to try to defend uh, what the White House is saying uh, by these uh, what they call inaccurate descriptions about his memory lapses, Allie. Allie, thanks. Ken, let me go back to you here, because Allie is pointing out, right, the fact that this could be and is already turning into very much a political hot potato for President Biden. We've already seen reaction now from former President Trump, his, you know, likely competitor here in a general election, if polling and the races continue to go the way that uh, history has shown that they are going to go. Um, there are distinctions and differences, though, between, and the special counsel point this, points this out, between the, what we're going to call the Biden document bucket, right, and the Trump document bucket. Ex explain those two buckets. Yeah, they're not even in the same universe, these cases, Hallie. And the special counsel made a point of going there. Essentially, he didn't have to. This is a report about President Biden's conduct. But he made a point of saying, here's where the Biden case is distinguished from the Trump case. And he kind of had to do that because you have these two uh, uh, presidential candidates who both mishandled classified information. One's being prosecuted, one isn't. And what Rob Hur said was, the Trump case is different because, first of all, he was asked for the documents back and he refused. And then, secondly, he's accused of obstructing justice by ordering subordinates to destroy evidence and then lie about it. So that's deeply, deeply significant and serious criminal conduct. He's been indicted on a, in a 41-count indictment in connection with that conduct. And what Rob Hur said was that was markedly different than what President Biden did and what other presidents so, who have kept classified information over the years has done. Can I ask you, because you've been pouring through this since it dropped several hours ago, three hours ago now, what have we not talked about that you think it is an important point for us to make here, Ken, based on your reporting and the folks that you're talking to? So one interesting thing that has not gotten a lot of attention is the ghostwriter who was recording the conversations with President Biden back in 2017 for that book, when he learned that the special counsel was appointed, he actually deleted 
many of those recordings. This is all described in the report. Uh, and the, Rob Herr's team says that they considered charging this person with obstruction of justice, but he came clean. He went to the FBI and said that he, in fact, deleted uh, this material. He gave them his hard drives, and the FBI was able to recover the recordings. And so they had ultimately did not charge him with obstruction of justice, but that was a really, uh, that, that's the kind of thing I think the Trump team may try to make some hay out of. Ken Delanian, thank you so much. So, Danny Savalos, what say you about all of this? What is standing out to you related to what we've seen now from this long-awaited special counsel report on President Biden? That this was an indictment without an actual indictment, falling short huh. of actually indicting President Biden. I mean, it, it one wonders what the purpose of the report was, to basically clear him, but then do everything but clear him, uh, call him doddering, call him uh, forgetful, call him someone who really, I mean, reading between the lines, what I see is a prosecutor saying, this is how he appeared in the interview. This is his sort of character that he'll use on the stand, and that will convince a jury. And we as prosecutors can't do anything to stop that. I just keep going back to the idea that, and, and by the way, obviously this is a lot different than what former President Trump did. Former President Trump's allegations are much more serious. But that doesn't change the fact that uh, the report concludes that Biden willfully held on to these documents. I, again, I've said it before, I was shocked. I thought the evidence tended to show that Biden accidentally had these documents, inadvertently. But by concluding that he did so willfully, they've essentially made out the elements of a, several of the different crimes. And then to conclude, which, by the way, is the right thing to do. Prosecutors should consider whether they should get, they can get, a conviction based on all the contextual issues. But just the fact that a defendant doesn't remember committing the alleged crimes, that's just not usually a basis that I've seen for declining to prosecute. Danny Savalos, we're glad to have your legal analysis on with us here tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. There's a lot of legal analyz analyzing that, that's happening tonight because of what happened over at the Supreme Court today as well here in Washington, where there seems to be an answer now, at least for now, to a question the justices have never faced before. Can a state, can a single state kick a presidential candidate off the ballot? And from what we heard today, at least from the tea leaves, the signs point to no. No, they can't. It's part of that historic case brought by voters in Colorado who argue that Donald Trump cannot run in that state this year because of his push to overturn his 2020 election loss. They're connecting it to the Civil War era amendment designed to prevent Confederate rebels from holding office ever again. It basically says like, hey, you can't be an insurrectionist and also president. That's what it comes down to. So that's what's at the heart of this matter here. So what seems to be persuading the justices that Mr. Trump should be on the ballot in Colorado? Let's go through it. Let's go through the case. There is this question first of whether Donald Trump or any former president is an officer of the United States. That particular phrasing is important because that's mentioned in that amendment we just showed you. It depends on the different oaths, the different officials take. Colorado lawyers say, yeah, Mr. Trump violated voters' rights. Watch. The reason we're here is that President Trump tried to disenfranchise 80 million Americans who voted against him, and the Constitution doesn't require that he be given another chance. But Mr. Trump's attorneys are going hard on another piece of this, whether Mr. Trump actually engaged in an insurrection. Did he actually engage in insurrection? They don't think so. This was a riot. It was not an insurrection. The events were shameful, criminal, violent, all of those things, but it did not qualify as insurrection, as that term is used in Section 3. Then there's this question of whether it's actually up to Congress and not the courts to pass a law that would kick Mr. Trump off the ballot. Like, is that the avenue this whole thing would have to go through? Congress nationally rather than a single state like Colorado on the state level. Interestingly, it was one of the justices on the liberal side who seemed open to this argument from Mr. Trump's attorneys. I think that the question that you have to confront is why a single state should decide who gets to be president of the United States. In other words, you know, this question of whether a former president is disqualified for insurrection uh, to be president again is, you know, just say it. It sounds awfully national to me. National to her, she says. Then this last one, does the whole thing apply to people running for office or just people already in office? Obviously, Donald Trump is not in office at the moment. He's just running. That's why that matters. Yumish Alcindor is outside the Supreme Court. So the justices heard all of that, everything we just showed, Yumish. And it seems like from the conservative end of the spectrum to the more liberal end of the spectrum for the justices, they all seemed kind of skeptical of the argument Colorado was making. Fair? 
That is fair to say, Hallie. It's, it was definitely the majority of justices today sounded as though they were saying that Colorado as a single state shouldn't have the, the power to decide who is going to be president of the United States and should not be allowed to take uh, former President Trump off the Republican primary ballot. Of course, they haven't ruled yet, but both sides did sound somewhat confident, but Team Trump is feeling very confident after these oral arguments. We're hearing from our team at NBC News that former President Trump is saying that he might win as, by as much as eight to one on this 6-3 majority, which means that he might even win the votes of some liberal justices. We also heard, though, from some plaintiffs. I'm going to play some sound for you from 91-year-old Norma Anderson. Take a listen. You cannot serve if you committed insurrection. What is trying to throw out an election? I call it insurrection as well as raiding the U.S. Capitol. Now, Hallie, that's a 91-year-old Republican woman from Colorado who is part of this legal challenge saying that she sees it as, as clear-cut. That being said, the Colorado Secretary of State told us today um, that she's hoping that there's just a quick decision here because ballots are already being mailed out and more ballots will be being mailed out with Donald Trump's name on it. And they're worried that people might vote for Donald Trump and then have their, their votes not count. So she's saying that she really wants an answer to this really quickly, Hallie. What's also interesting, Yamish, and you've made this point, I think it's a good one, right, is the way that the justices seem to be thinking about and considering the potential political ramifications of a ruling on this down the road. And it comes at a time when our polling shows the Supreme Court's approval rating is at an all-time low right now, something like 28 percent support. There are political ramifications in a lot of different contexts to be thinking about here, no? Certainly, there are a number of states across this country that are looking at this issue of whether or not former President Trump should be on the ballot. Any decision that the Supreme Court makes is going to have national impact. We should also know that there are some conservative officials in red states who are saying if Donald Trump loses this case, that they are looking at possibly striking President Biden from their ballot. So definitely it's a political question here, along with the fact this is the Supreme Court that has had its approval rating going down and down ever since Roe v. Wade was overturned, which, of course, was when they revoked the federal right to an abortion. Ali. Yamish Alcindor live for us at the Supreme Court. Yamish, it's great to see you. Thank you. To Philly now, where we're learning tonight that three bodies have been found after a family of six, including children, was involved in a shooting and a fire at their home outside of Philadelphia. Officials also now say this fire may have been set on purpose. Two police officers who were shot at the scene are expected to recover. Police have been trying to search this home all day. It's been moving pretty slowly because it's, they're worried that it could collapse, that the building could actually come down on them. I want to get to George Solis now, who's on the ground in East Lansdowne, Pennsylvania. What else do we know about potential motive here, about what even started this? And the latest in the investigation is we're getting some of these late-breaking details in, George. Yeah, Hallie, and to say the least, a lot of officials and people here in the community are calling this a bizarre story because there are so many moving parts. And we sort of want to reset the clock here for anyone that's just catching up to speed here when this. This all unfolded yesterday afternoon when two officers responded to this scene after reports that an 11-year-old girl had been shot. And the officers arrived here. They're met with shots. They say that the person shooting retreated inside of the home. Two officers were wounded. Big fire is set. That fire burns for hour. Firefighters unable to knock it down because they were concerned about that active shooter. The all clear is given. Those officers were taken to local hospitals. And now the DA is saying, as you mentioned, it appears that some of those people inside of the home, those family members, they've been identified as the Lee family, are presumed dead. Later, uh, late this afternoon, the DA is saying that they believe the body of the shooter may have been recovered because they actually found a rifle next to that body and also what appears to be the body of a child. It's sort of the grim news that a lot of people were fearing would be the reality here when we're talking about three adults and three children that were unaccounted for. So again, the search continuing right now at this hour, officials saying they are taking a pause for the day and will begin their search for more evidence tomorrow morning. The DA holding a number of press conferences today throughout the day, sort of keeping us in the loop, still not identifying the shooter by name or his connection to the family. But take a listen to what he did have to say earlier today. We've recovered three bodies total from the house. Uh, one is the person we think was shooting at police officers because there was a, a, a rifle recovered with that body. Uh, and then there were two more, looks like might be a child uh, and might be another, uh, either a child or someone uh, relatively young. Uh, so we have three people of the six that we are afraid are in the house recovered. Halley DA Jack Stolzheimer here in Delaware County saying this is going to take some time. It could take days. It could take 
even a week because they are moving so meticulously around this structure because it was burning for so long. They believe it is not structurally sound. And you did mention sort of the highlight in all of this, those two officers, both veterans of the force, one from East Lansdowne, one from Lansdowne, one of those officers today returning home. Unclear when the other one, but the good news is both of them sustained non-life-threatening injuries. So a big send-off for them today. This community very grateful for their service and quickly jumping into action. Allie. George Solis live for us there outside Philadelphia. George, thanks. Coming up, a scary situation caught on camera in California. We'll show you how one woman was rescued from a 26-foot sinkhole. Plus, another health warning for Trader Joe's, what appears to be contaminating one popular product. Next. Check this out at uh, Boston's airport. We're about to show it to you here, where today two jet blue planes kind of collided, essentially brushing each other while on the tarmac. You can see how close they got here. So part of one's wing touched the tail section of the other plane. They were in this area, they were getting de-iced, so they were still under JetBlue's control. Passengers say they didn't know what was going on, but nobody was hurt. Both flights were canceled. You see it circled there, that collision point. JetBlue says the planes were taken out of service to be fixed. All of it coming with a white hot spotlight right now on safety and the FAA and the serious shortage of air traffic controllers in this country. Now the FAA is racing to staff up and train a new generation. Our Tom Costello got a rare behind the scenes look at its training academy. He's joining us now. It's an academy, Tom, that you and I have talked about before because they're trying to get these folks trained. You don't snap your fingers and have people ready to go do air yeah. traffic controlling. It takes a minute. It's a steep learning curve, and uh, the reason that they need to add more controllers as fast as possible is because there's a mandatory retirement age for controllers of 56, all right, 56, and they simply don't have enough right now, and they can't train enough fast enough. In fact, take a look at the graphics here about how quickly they're trying to and what the problem is here. Uh, right now, they say, according to the FAA, that they have a shortage of a about, there are the numbers, 1,300 more controllers needed according to the FAA. However, the union says, no, 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 it's more than that. 3,500 are needed, in fact. Uh, but here's the deal. We, show you the, we will show you the video from the Air Traffic Control Academy. The washout rate, 30%. Uh, at the academy, 30%, it's not easy. And then after that, they go to control towers and another 30% drop out. This is not an easy job. Why? In part because once you do start getting on the job, it is, in fact, a, a long day. It is mandatory overtime. It is uh, often six-day weeks. On top of that, you have to work holidays. you got to work your weekends, and it's stressful. And so the focus at the Air Traffic Control Academy is getting this next generation in. So did you hear that reflected in some of the folks you spoke with? Like, did you hear concerns about the potential for burnout, the high stress? Absolutely. Or were people, tell me about that. Absolutely. And here's what's fascinating. I talked to the guy who's in charge of all air traffic control uh, operations nationwide, and he was at the academy, and I said... What makes a good new controller? What makes a good student? What quali quali qualities yeah. makes a good student? Here's what he said. Who are you looking to recruit? Give me your idea of what kind of experience does somebody need? Those, those people that grow up game and those people that have that ability to see three-dimensional, you know, and again, to think three to four to five steps ahead. That is the type of person that it takes to do this job. Did you hear what he said? Video yeah. gamers. Isn't that funny? 20 somethings who are video gamers. They are really good at this job. They think multi dimensionally. They can anticipate, okay, if this Fast. goes wrong, I'm yeah. going to do X, Y, Z, multiple steps ahead. And they're not, they're not intimidated by massive amounts of data and computer imagery coming at you at once. I love that. Tom Costello, what a rare and interesting inside look at how this all comes together. Our thanks to Tom for that. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, the Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, says he has replaced his top general. A big shakeup in the Ukrainian military after months of reported tension on a strategy. It's all happening at a tough moment when Ukraine's counteroffensive has struggled and as Russia steps up, ups its attacks in Ukraine. Number two, look at this rescuer saving a woman. She fell down this 25-foot sinkhole in California. Do you see somebody? You see that person on a rope? They're going down into the hole to try to get her. She told first responders that the ground just opened up underneath her when she was walking in her yard. Amazingly, she's fine. She has some minor injuries, but she's expected to be okay. Number three, do you remember Bard, the Google AI chatbot? It's now called Gemini. 
with Google rolling out an app for Gemini and a new premium model for 20 bucks a month. It says it can be a personal tutor and help with more advanced coding. Google's calling this the first step to making a true AI assistant as the company's trying to invest more in AI and compete with companies like Microsoft. Number four, the ag department is warning about chicken pilaf sold at Trader Joe's. It's this like lentil chicken, I think it's lentils, I don't know, rice, whatever. It might have rocks in it, they said. The USDA put out a public health alert after getting multiple complaints. One person said they ended up with a dental problem because of it. It's not for sale anymore. Traders recalled it. They say anybody who has it is going to get a full refund. Number five, the new medals for the Paris Olympics have a secret ingredient, little pieces of the Eiffel Tower embedded in every single gold, silver, and bronze for the summer. If you're thinking, wait a second, how do they get stuff from the Eiffel Tower into these medals? From renovations. They pulled the metal out of the tower during renovations and stuck little pieces in all of this hardware. Organizers called it the cherry on top. The big win at the Olympics. Pretty cool. It's taken in Michigan, where top aides for President Biden are headed to tonight to meet with some Arab American and Muslim leaders as President and candidate Biden, of course, try to shore up support from this voting bloc. He's facing more and more backlash because of his support for Israel, which has deepened its siege on Gaza. Yasmin Vesugian has more. Tonight, a spotlight on one of the main issues facing voters in this election. I will stand with Israel 100 percent. Give them whatever they need, whenever they need it, no questions asked. You don't have to be a Jew to be a Zionist. Bipartisan support for Israel, leaving some from one key voting bloc feeling abandoned by both parties, Muslim Americans. American Muslims, Arab Americans, and many American uh, voters who support the Palestinians are intensely angry and disillusioned with the policy of President Biden. There are about 8 million Muslims in the United States, and the group is a small yet mighty voting force. 71 percent of them turned out to vote in 2020, but now many feel like they're being forced to make a tough choice. So who would you vote for? Well, there is a third option. No vote. More than two-thirds of Muslim Americans voted for President Joe Biden in 2020. But that could change this year, with some making calls to, quote, abandon Biden altogether. If Joe Biden cannot see us, you can count us out in November. Some saying they're upset with President Biden bypassing Congress twice to deliver emergency military aid to Israel, meanwhile providing $121 million in humanitarian assistance to Gaza. But they're not favoring Republicans either, according to recent Democratic polling of Michigan by Lake Research Partners. This wouldn't be the first time we saw such a large swing for Muslim American voters. In 2000, 72 percent of the group voted for then-candidate George W. Bush. But just four years later, that's 72 percent turning into less than 1 percent. After September 11, George W. Bush became a different president. The surveillance of the American Muslim community, the loss of civil liberties, the Democratic Party at least promised to challenge that uh, injustice. And in 2024, they say they feel left behind again. They will tip the elections, especially in the major battleground states. In the 2020 race, Biden won in Michigan by just 150,000 votes, a swing state with one of the largest Muslim populations in the country. In the Michigan precincts with the highest concentration of Muslim and Arab Americans, 83 percent of the vote went to Biden. Now, only 16 percent say they'd vote for him in 2024. Almost all give the president's response to the Israel-Hamas war a, quote, poor rating. The Biden campaign says they'll continue to engage in conversations with the Arab American community, even if they disagree on policy decisions. And the Trump campaign says the former president had, quote, peace in the Middle East in his last term. The Haley campaign has not responded to our request for comment. As many Arab Americans and Muslim Americans face a difficult decision, experts warn if they don't show up to the polls, it could have a major impact on this year's election. Yasmin Vesugian, NBC News. When we come back, why police in Brazil are seizing the passport of a former president. Plus, the desperate search for survivors after a landslide in the Philippines. We'll show you. In just the last 20 minutes, we are hearing from the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, in his first interview with a member of Western media since Putin's invasion of Ukraine, as he's sitting down with former Fox News host Tucker Carlson who's been a real critic of U.S. support of Ukraine. 
We need to note here, Carlson has consistently repeated falsehoods, misinformation, and conspiracy theories. NBC News has not been provided any details about the circumstances under which this interview was recorded. And we are listening to the translation provided by Carlson. Matt Bodner is joining us now from London. And Matt, it seems like a lot of topics are being covered here, from detained journalist Evan Gershkovich to Vladimir Zelensky, the Ukrainian president, to Elon Musk and AI. Tell us some of the highlights here. Uh, thanks. Well, it, it's interesting. We're definitely being promised a lot of things from this interview. But uh, so far, we're just starting with the very traditional uh, Vladimir Putin history lesson. It's, it's actually quite a familiar thing to uh, a lot of us who have covered the president, uh, the Russian president, over many years uh, in Moscow and elsewhere. But uh, he's really good at talking for a very long time. Tucker actually began the interview with a disclaimer saying the first 30 minutes of this uh, are just ancient history. Vladimir Putin's going into it a thousand years ago in response to a first question that is essentially, uh, please explain your rationale for invading Ukraine. Uh, mm. So Vladimir Putin has immediately gone into this 30-minute this spiel. He's still going through it uh, uh, as uh, the latest moment that I've seen in the interview. Um, so we're going to keep watching. But um, so far, this is a very kind of typical Putin appearance. I do say he looks very low energy. Neither of mm. these men in the interview uh, appear to, to really... There's no rapport between the two of them. It's, it's really quite fascinating because uh, I think uh, both sides have gone into this thinking that they were going to somehow get something out of the other on this one. So dynamics so far in this uh, are up in the air and we're still in the history lesson. But a lot is being promised. We'll talk about the rationale for Putin for sitting down for this, because I should note, even the White House, even today we heard from the White House essentially warning of propaganda with uh, top National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby saying you shouldn't take at face value anything that Putin's going to say. That's correct. And I think that's exactly the rationale for what's happening here. I think, you know, the, you know, the Kremlin sits there, the Russian government sits there in Moscow and they watch everything we do, much like we watch everything they do. And they, yeah. you know, they can see what's going on in Washington. And I think that the, the, the timing of this interview, I think, is very deliberate. It might not be the entire rationale for the interview itself, of course. Uh, Carlson has said that he's been asking for this interview for a few years. Everyone's been asking for this interview for a few years. Uh, so I think it's, it's definitely, there's a lot to read into uh, in terms of who the Kremlin selected to give an interview mm -hmm. and what's going on in America at the time that they give this interview. And, of course, the things that, I, I, that we expect to hear from Vladimir Putin. This is essentially... Putin speaking directly at a large portion of the American electorate, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the right wing in the U.S., so to speak, who are, who are very supportive of Carlson and the message that he preaches. So uh, that is the Kremlin's aim here, is to speak directly at that electorate. Hallie? Matt Bodner, watching all of it tonight. We'll look for more updates from you throughout the evening. Matt, thank you. Thank you. NBC News covers hundreds of other international stories every day. And because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our teams around the world have done it for you. Here's some of what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Out of the Philippines, rescuers are searching for survivors of a landslide that has killed at least 11 people so far and hurt more than 30 others. Something like 100 people are still missing, according to the area's disaster agency. You can see some of the aftermath here. The landslide buried homes and two buses that have been picking up miners at a nearby gold mine. Out of Brazil, federal police confiscating the former president's passport today. They want to keep Jair Bolsonaro in the country as they investigate an alleged coup attempt after his defeat in the 2022 election there. Officers searched homes and offices of Bolsonaro's top aides, and according to court documents, the ex-president knew of the supposed plot. And out of Spain, rice farmers are sounding the alarm that a type of rice used to make that, that is used to make paella could be under threat because of new rules from the EU. They say they lost half their crop last year to a fungus because the EU banned the pesticide used to stop it. They're joining farmers all across Europe who have been protesting some of these regulations. We've told you about those protests here on the show. And in just the last couple of minutes, the Marines are wrapping up an update on the five date on the five Marines who died after their helicopter went missing in a California forest. That mission that we told you about last night, going from search and rescue, of course, to recovery. But in a statement, President Biden says, we are mourning this profound loss and we honor their selfless service and ultimate sacrifice. Dan DeLuce is joining us now from the Pentagon. And I think we just saw a quick clip of that news conference wrapping up. What have we learned as you have now pressed the Pentagon's press secretary as well around some of the questions about the safety of this particular chopper that was being used? Now, Hallie, from that press conference, we now know that the Marines have informed the families, the next of kin of those five crew members who died tragically in that helicopter crash involving the Sea Stallion cargo helicopter that's been plagued by problems in the past. And when I asked the Pentagon today uh, about aviation safety more broadly, not just with this helicopter, here's what Pentagon Press Secretary General Ryder had to say.
They will, as always, continue to look at their training, maintenance, and safety programs to ensure that we learn from every incident and apply those lessons into their risk management programs and management of those fleets. But still, uh, still a lot of questions here. In fact, first starting with, uh, why was a Sea Stallion helicopter sent off from uh, Las Vegas into Southern California in a historically massive rainstorm uh, that was sweeping across Southern California? It's not clear why that routine flight would have been necessary. That's one question. And then, of course, this particular helicopter, one of the largest in the U.S. military, has been plagued by engine problems over the years. And there was a similar tragic uh, accident in 2018. And then there are these wider questions. Other aircraft, other helicopters are also having safety problems. And some independent studies have suggested that there is a problem with training, having s sufficient training and flight hours for pilots and enough training for maintenance crews. And that those things may be uh, getting insufficient attention and then that snowballs into problems later. Dan Deleuze, live for us there at the Pentagon with that developing story. Dan, thank you. We've got a lot more coming up here on the show, including that one-time border bill that now has no actual funding for the border. We're talking to one senator about what else is in it, why he thinks it's so important, and his reaction to that special counsel report on President Biden in just a second. Here to Washington now, where there is perhaps, maybe, possibly the faintest of heartbeats in the Senate's now borderless border bill after they passed a key procedural vote of this really slimmed down bill, a bill that doesn't include the border stuff, right? It's got everything else you see here, money for Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan, humanitarian aid to Gaza, a new plan to try to fight the spread of deadly fentanyl. But here's the thing, this bill still has a whole bunch of hurdles to jump over before a final vote that would send it over to the House. I want to bring in Democratic Senator from Colorado, Michael Bennett, who is joining us now. Senator, thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks, Hallie, for having me back. It's there has been, you. of course, there's been a ton of drama where you're standing over the course of the last few days on both sides of the Capitol. Well, on the Senate side, your colleague across the aisle, Rand Paul, said earlier today he would object to anything speeding up what he described as this rotten foreign spending bills passage. So, Your point, I know, is that some of these countries desperately need aid. How much longer are they going to have to wait? Well, hopefully they're not going to have to wait longer than this weekend to get it through the Senate, Hallie. We've got now um, uh, 17 Republicans joining the Democrats. So we've got, I think, 50, almost two, or two thirds of the Senate saying we should move forward with this bill. Ukraine is literally out of bullets. And over the last two years, they've they've achieved uh, so much more than anybody could have imagined pushing Putin back. And they've stood up not just for themselves, but for democracy, for NATO, for us. And this is a critical moment when our resolve is being tested, when American leadership uh, is in the balance. And we've got to get it done this weekend. Of course, even if we get it done, then there's mm. the whole issue of getting it through the House of Representatives. You've pointed out that there's $60 billion in money for Ukraine hanging in the balance here. You've described how, as you say, they're basically out of bullets here. You've done things like, you know, trying to get the Senate focused on that, um, doing some things like holding up government funding and money for the FAA, countless lengthy right. floor speeches, et cetera. Do you believe your tactics move the needle at all to get where we are tonight? I think we have moved. Uh, you know, there were times over the last four months when, if you talk to people around here, they thought it was a fait accompli that uh, that we were that our broken politics just weren't going to let this happen. And the argument that I've been trying to make, I think others have been trying to make, is that Putin's had real trouble on the battlefield here, and that the Ukrainians taking back half of the territory, uh, li giving their lives for democracy, uh, deserve better than our broken politics. They've set an example that's inspiring inspired the rest of the world. And I think it's beginning to inspire people here as well that don't want to leave, that don't want to leave Ukraine in the lurch. And I think Putin knows how to read our newspapers. He knows how divided we are. He knows how dysfunctional we are. He believes that democracy saw our finest hour in the 20th century. Xi Jinping thinks the same thing. This is an opportunity for us to show uh, something very different, that democracy is alive and kicking, that we have the inspiration of the Ukrainian people mm. who have fought this tyrant back, 
and that we're not going to let them down. And I think we are not going to let them down, uh, uh, notwithstanding all of the anguish and aggravation and, and insanity that it's taken us to finally get to this to this weekend. To, to the point that you're making here, when you talk about aggravation and insanity, I think there are people who are watching this, who are watching the work that your chamber is doing, going, can Congress actually get anything done? Can they? Yeah. Well, Putin's saying Congress can't get anything done. As I said, he's counting on that. And I think what we're going to find out is that maybe the outer edge of our failure is the Ukraine funding. In other words, mm. that we're going to say we're going to step back from the brink and say that's a bridge too far. We're not going to screw that up. Our kids and our grandkids deserve better than that. We have just shown a serious breakdown when it comes to the border. We could not come. We came to a bipartisan agreement at the insistence of the Republicans who wanted this as part of Ukraine. Then they walked away from it. You know, I represent a pretty purple state, Hallie, mm -hmm. and Republicans and Democrats and independents would like to see us have a functional immigration system. They know the one we have today is broken. Uh, my view of that is, look, let's get the Ukraine stuff done. Let's get the other funding done here. And then maybe we can go back and have a discussion about about immigration without a, holding a gun to everybody's head and do improve you, the system for the American people. Do you think that conversation can happen on the border on immigration this calendar year, this election year, realistically? It, well, it's going to be really hard with with a presidential candidate in the form of Donald Trump saying that his election chances are going to be hurt if Joe Biden ever reaches a bipartisan deal on the border. You know, we've seen a complete collapse in the last week for that very reason. Uh, but uh, but hope springs eternal. We can continue to try. I think in the meantime, Joe Biden is going to be able to make the case that he saw that we've got a, some serious issues at the border because of the way transnational gangs have been smuggling people uh, over the last five five years or so to that border, making billions and billions of dollars. And he said, look, I don't want transnational gangs in charge of that. And I brought a serious proposal to the Congress and the Republicans walked away. I can guarantee you this, Hallie, Donald Trump's not going to make our immigration system better. And I think Joe Biden's going to be able to make this case in this election, not just on immigration, but the economy as well. And and hopefully as a result, uh, have another four years. So then let's talk about that election. Let's talk about the next four years, because by now I'm sure you've seen the special counsel's report about President Biden and his handling of classified documents here. A report that in several instances describes him having issues with his memory, his mental state, saying that they were concerned, they have considered that the president would likely present himself as a well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. You mentioned you are from a pretty purple state, Senator, as you yourself said. Do you have concerns about the about what you have seen and heard based on this special counsel report? Uh, I haven't had a chance to read the report, but I'm not going to dodge what you read. I, he I heard what you read. Um, it's not consistent with the conversations that I've had with the president. I do wish that elected leaders in this country would learn how to treat classified material. I I'm on the Intelligence Committee, and, you know, the Republicans and Democrats on that committee take our responsibilities apparently a lot more seriously than others do um, when it comes to protecting that, that that information. But there's nothing to compare the way President Biden responded when those documents showed up at his house and he and he invited the, the lawyers in. He turned it all over to the Justice Department. Donald Trump still won't admit that the documents that he took, he even took. So this is another case where there's just n no comparison between these two individuals. President Biden's attorneys have argued that they believe it was not appropriate for the special counsel to reference repeatedly some of the things that came up related to the president's age, related to the president's memory. Do you think it was inappropriate for the special counsel to include that in his final report? Uh, uh, that's not a judgment I can make, Hallie. But I do think the president, look, the, the, the American people know that the president is not the youngest president that we have, that we've had. And, and we know that that's an issue of concern among the American people. And I I believe the president of the United States, as he campaigns uh, into the fall, is going to be able to stand up well against Donald Trump, who, by the way, is the same age as Joe Biden, and make the case that 
that he's been able to not just uh, not just win a political campaign against Donald Trump, which he did, but accomplish some of the most significant things that any president has in modern in our modern lifetimes, including a bipartisan infrastructure bill, including uh, leading the international order in this war against Putin and a bunch of other stuff in between. He's obviously going to have to take that case to the American people and make that case mm. to the American people, and I'm confident he'll be able to do it. Senator Michael Bennett, we're glad to have you on tonight as our newsmaker. Thanks for having the show. me. Thank you very Thank much you, for Hallie. staying late. I appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.